Ooh, it's barking. Yeah, that sounds fun. Let's go for a minute. How do I see if I'm... I can't go anywhere on my phone, so I can't... Oh, no, the chair disappeared. What happened? Oh, there it goes. Okay, maybe just reset for a second because I was live. It went live. Okay, it says I'm live now. I'm sorry, this is probably like potato quality, but okay, okay, I can navigate the chat. So, oh, it keeps going away. No, go back. I want to see the chat. Okay, apparently YouTube likes to remove the chat if I go no. So, um, I am in the middle of like rearranging my office and my it's a whole story. I have I moved to this place. Walls were really super damaged, like dirty, like really dirty walls and like covered in like hundreds probably of like little pinholes in the wall. And like they got kind of like halfway repaired in terms of like filling in the, the holes in the wall. But it's taken a long time to get it actually painted and the people who were supposed to come to like finish the repair work and do the painting were supposed to be here on Wednesday and then they couldn't do Wednesday so they showed up on Thursday instead. So my office is disassembled and covered in tarps and... It's a whole thing. I think I should be able to reassemble my desk and stuff over this weekend, but I don't know. It's still very strong. It smells like paint in there, but that's my week. That's what I've been doing. It's not like, it's not awful. It's just sort of, you know, something I, I have to deal with. And I did my makeup all sparkly today. I did it like bigger than I normally do. I don't know if you guys can like tell because this is definitely potato quality, but I did like glitter on my eyeballs and I did kind of like the blush into eyeshadow. Thing and I kind of like, oh, it's kind of bright here. I don't really have any like lighting stuff or anything, so we're just kind of. I don't know if that's better. I would like it if the chat could stay. Okay, I want all of the chat. There we go. Why do you think there's such a lot of good girl representation on TikTok? I don't know. I'm not on TikTok. I, I assume that like brats are like more, I feel like it's more of a TikTok vibe because I think TikTok skews younger and I think bratting tends to skew younger. Not that people like grow out of being brats because they're not really brats, but I mean in the sense of like bratting was very unacceptable in the BDSM community for a long time. But I think the people for whom it's the most acceptable are younger folk and it's kind of been glorified i've had like a lot of comments kind of recently from people that tell me about facebook pages and like tiktok stuff with brats and like littles being like who is it somebody told me it was um i think it was like a ddlg or like a group of littles that said that littles are actually the doms in the relationship because they're the ones who set the rules and instructions for their caregivers and i'm like is that you being a dom or is that you having an unwilling partner that you're tricking into being a dom for you like putting on a costume you know like i feel like there's probably some people that like their partner is really nervous about doing bdm and so the easiest thing to do is just have the partner like figure everything out and just do whatever they say but then sometimes it's like if you have to make up all the rules for your partner and write the contract and enforce everything and remind them do they really want to be doing it or are you just making them do it because it's important to you, but you also don't want to leave the relationship because you think it would be too hard to find someone else. You know, like there's, I can't stream it. I'm trying to like keep an eye on the chat in like two different places. <laughs> Brats are the crossfitters of the BDSM community. I think people treat Brats like the crossfitters of the BDSM community, but I don't know if they reach the same level that crossfitters do. But I, I think there would be people that would probably agree with that assessment. All right. Uh, apparently, my limitations on scrolling in the chat are much more than they are on, like, my normal computer setup. So bear with me. Uh, if you're new here, I don't have my normal stuff on screen, so I don't normally stream from my phone. But I am streaming from my phone today, and so what that means is we're winging it. We're doing it live. So I, we just remember everyone, this is an 18 plus only stream. If you're at least 18, please don't be here. This is for adults. Talk to other adults about adult subjects. And I, do I have, will it show my, oh, okay. Uh, all my normal stuff is linked below, but weirdly it's not my streaming setup. It's the default for my video uploads. 
So I actually don't have my FAQ link below, but there is normally an FAQ. If you want to check it out, it's linked in all the other streams. But that's basically it. And I will try to answer all the questions as they come in in order. But because of the fact that I am on my phone, it's much more difficult for me to stream and like look at comments at the same time than it normally would be. And so I'm probably going to end up missing some things, but I will try my best to get to everything. <laughs> yes, fuck it, we'll do a live. Thank you, Tuxie. Thank you. Yes, and give the video, the live stream a thumbs up if you're enjoying it or just because you like my channel or whatever. And we'll do it. I'm just hoping for a nice stream and no creepy weird stuff in chat. Okay, we'll try to avoid subjects that would cause people to be creepy and weird. I was very limited in terms of the text I could put for like a live stream title because it was for my phone. So I don't have anything spicy to title at all. It's just like, give you some Q&A, be here, be square, you know? Okay, I thought I saw one that was about asexuality. I'm trying to find it again. I hope it didn't get lost. Okay, yeah, I just lost. Sorry, I if you asked a question about asexuality, I remember seeing it, but now I can't find it again, so re-ask it. Okay, I'm gonna have to be like on top of it with comments. Uh, Streamlabs is actually not linked below because it's not hooked up to my phone, uh, but a YouTube super chat should work if you wanna have your question highlighted. That would be the easiest thing to do. I love the videos that you post about BDSM are so helpful. Well, thank you, Sarah. I'm glad that you enjoy them. I like making them. What happens if you marry your daddy? Um, I assume that everything stays the same, except for now you're legally married. I mean, I don't know. I have like weird, weird views about marriage. Maybe it's not weird. I just feel like a marriage is important for a lot of people. It is for me. I feel like marriage shouldn't be the thing that radically shifts your relationship. It should be a symbol of the existing depth of your relationship and the commitment, like getting married some people treat it like, a, oh, this is going to solve our problem. It's going to make you feel more secure. It's going to make me seem more committed. It's going to help you get over me cheating. It's going to help. Uh, I don't know what else do people say about marriage. Oh, no, they kind of treat it like a relationship fixer. But I don't think that works. I think getting married is really just signing a piece of paper that allows you to, like, file joint taxes and have visitation rights in the hospital and, like, you know, the government-related stuff. But marriage itself, I don't think, is as typically world shattering radical alter, radical alteration to our relationship unless you like didn't live together before getting married uh you know that could be a radical shift but it's like the marriage itself is not necessarily a big shift but i assume that if you get married and you're in a bdsm relationship daddy dom little girl pet play ms relationship whatever flavor it is it's more or less going to be the same except for now it's more legally official I don't know. I've never ever married a daddy before, so I can't say. Maybe it isn't that different. I don't know. Okay, see, so we have a super chat. Then I have super chats on here. Hello. YouTube. Wiki, wiki. Oh, thank you, Jay. Thank you. Oh, by the way, I am. I don't have a link for this because I'm on my phone. How many times are you going to say that during the stream? I am doing a fundraiser, or I'm participating in a fundraiser for earthquake relief in Syria and Turkey and just so happens that I am also working on doing a free DS power change summit from February 20th to 24th. The tickets for that are free. You just have to reserve one on the website to get the email to access everything. And then if you want to get an all access pass for the recordings of everything, bonus things, extra materials, extra classes. There's an all access pass you can get. And then because I have an affiliate link for it, you can get an all access pass and I get a portion of those proceeds from that. And then I am donating. I don't know if I got, I'm kind of waiting till the end of the day today to donate anything. Cause I just want to see, I want to like maximize my donation, but I don't want to wait too long before sending it anywhere, you know? Cause it, like if I send it in a month, it's not gonna like have the same impact, you know? Um, but I'm by the end of the day, I'm gonna like donate part of the proceeds from that to earthquake relief, and I'll post a picture on Twitter. I don't really can I can I put it on YouTube? I don't really know what the best way is to put because I don't want to spam everyone. Oh, thank you, Erica. Thank you. Um, I should post a link to 
I'm gonna try to do this from my computer. I don't know how this is gonna work. I have like my computer, but I have my camera equipment set up because I'm, <laughs> I would show you guys, but I just have crap all over this desk. I didn't wanna like dox myself by accident because I forgot I had like tax documentation on it. Um, but I have like, I have like a card table in like the corner of this room set up and I have my desktop on it and a keyboard and mouse. And that's pretty much it. I have my camera stuff because it's, it's stored away, but I, I technically have computer access. I just can't stream film from it, which is, is good. Um, but actually it's really cool. This like summit that I'm participating in is being coordinated by Dom Sub Living. There's a lot of really cool people that are doing it. Uh, Sunny, uh, Megatron, Loving BDSM podcast. We're all teaching different classes that relate to DS relationships from like long distance DS relationships to contracts, negotiations, switches in power change relationships. Thank you, Booper. Thank you. Um, and it's really cool because all of it is pre-recorded though. So that can be good because then you can watch it anytime from anywhere that day. But it's not the same, like it's not as interactive as like a typical class uh, setting would be, just FYI. But I saw people's presentations and they're good. So I think it's worth it because the price is free. And I will also be posting, people on my Patreon, I will be posting a copy of my class, my class notes, and the copy of the slideshow that I did. That will all go on Patreon after my talk is live. So if you just want to see that, it'll be all on Patreon. And it'll be for, I don't know, probably just general in any level of Patreon, probably. I haven't decided yet. Um, where is the link? Oh, is that it? Oh, here we go. Okay, I found it. That took me a while to get to my email. I wish I could show you guys my freaking email inbox because it's, I don't know if other creators have this problem, but like my email inbox is just constantly like, it's, it's just, it's constantly just like a bunch of, there are real like sponsorship advertisements that are like, hey, HelloFresh wants to sponsor your video. And then there's ones that are like objectively, definitely just like catfishing or, or just like phishing email stuff where it's like, hey, we work with Warner Brothers Game Studio. Do you want a free code to download, you know, Harry Potter Legacy or whatever, what is it, Hogwarts Legacy, whatever it is, the one that's been in the news recently. That one, you know, I want a free code for that. And it's definitely just like they just, they're going to put malware on your computer. And it's just like my whole inbox, like every day I get like five to 10 of these emails. And I'm like, I always delete them. I always mark them as spam, but I still get them constantly. And I don't know what that's about. But yeah, that's that's what's going on currently in my life. Um, if I'm trying to get the chat back, and it's not popping up. Okay. Hello, chat. Did I mess it up? Um, I'm not, so it's not that I'm, I'm moving and my place is under construction. I moved recently, like in this past year and I had like the carpet and the paint needed to be redone in a couple of rooms and they just redid the paint in my office cause it was gross and nasty and the, 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 the you guys couldn't see it cause the camera was far away, but my, the, one of the walls was like covered in holes just for some, I don't think, I think a kid lived there and had like posters or something because I can't think of why else that would have happened but they finally repaired it painted it and so I had to like take down all my office stuff and like cover it in tarp so that they could paint around it obviously because the room's not super big and yeah that's what happened that's why I'm on my phone but hopefully next week I will be back to normal and if I'm not it'll be because the carpet's being done because that also needs to be done because the carpet is disgusting and covered in stains love it adult life getting your work interrupted because they have to replace the carpet because it's gross and nasty. Actually, I shouldn't say that. I don't want to make it sound like it's worse than it is. It's just like, I don't know what it is, but in that room in particular, there's like one really big yellow stain. And they had it like professionally cleaned and everything. And it just didn't, I don't know what in like, did they melt crayons on it? Like what, what would cause, like, it's not like, it's not like a urine thing. It's not like anything that like enzymes could remove because I tested that. It's just like, they got paint on it or hair dye or so I don't know what it was. Anyway, it's all getting torn out. So we're, that's going to be in flux for a little bit. Lots is going on in my life. Can I please? I don't know why. Oh, there's filters. I can put, I can put filters on here. 
Interesting. Interesting choice. Oh, there we go. Jesus, that took a minute. I don't know why. Um, since there's no bandit cam, what's the dog doing? She is, I think, sleeping downstairs. That's what she was doing earlier today. She has like a big purple, we call it the purple poof. It's like a big purple, like really nice quality bean bag. And she has indented two holes on opposite sides of the bean bag. And she'll, she alternates which one she'll sleep in. Um, and I think when I went downstairs earlier to get water, she was in one of them and we put a blanket next to it. She could uh, perk her chin on it and that's, or, or perch her chin on it. That's what she was doing. Um, all right, let me scroll, look for questions. I think my phone battery should be good. I shouldn't have any problems with uh, keeping the stream going. It would mostly just be YouTube, FYI. If we end up ending early, it's probably a YouTube thing. Because I actually don't know, do they limit your stream since it's on your phone? I watch all your videos for a year straight, and now I'm living the best videos in my life. Oh, thank you, Erica. That's so awesome. I'm so proud of you and so, like, so grateful I could participate in helping make that happen. I mean, really, it was you, though. I just gave you ideas. You executed on it. I did the easy part. You did the hard part. Have you ever done breath play? Yes. I don't talk about it. Um, and, of course, I'm just answering this because I don't have my FAQ or, like, whatever available because I don't know if you would have known this. But I don't give advice on, like, how to do breath play or anything just because it's YouTube. It's the Internet. You need to have in-person tactile feedback and a really well-trained instructor and I'm not one of those people that's way outside my skill set and knowledge. I've done it. I've learned how to do it multiple times. I don't do it regularly. And the main thing that I do is uh, being submerged in water. It's the main way that I engage in it. I don't like random spontaneous breath play during scenes or anything. It like, freaks me out. Um, and I've had people do that recently where they've been like, oh, I thought you liked this. Well, they would just start choking me in the middle of something happening and be like why would you why would you do that so i've also experienced the like very common like somebody starting to do breath play with you in the middle of something because they thought you were into it type thing and I'm, I'm not a fan but it can be done on a scale of level of responsibility is what i would say there are ways to do it that are more responsible than others uh before i started following evie i had no idea about the reputation of brats I've ever done bratting, but I love the idea of it. How do we be good brats? I have a video that's a couple of years old where I talk about like bratting and like good versus bad bratting. And essentially the quick answer to that question is, is always do things inside your partner's limits. Talk about things ahead of time in the same way that you would with any other partnership. Although typically most DS relationships or, or BDSM scenes don't like require as much of a obvious navigation of like where the tops or doms limits are because typically if it is something outside of their limits they're gonna say i can't do that or they excuse me they will just not be into whatever kind of play it is at the side of their limits and then you wouldn't be negotiating with them in the first place but when it comes to bragging this would be really clear okay this is okay to brag about this is like okay to brag about this is not this is when to do it where to do it how to do it because like you can brag a bunch of different ways right and your partner might be okay with like verbal bratting, but not be okay with eye rolling. And your partner might be okay with eye rolling, but not okay with you stomping your feet or slamming doors. So you have to be very careful about like how you're doing it and what context you're doing it in and just make sure those limitations are all very, very clear. And as long as you do that, you should probably be fine. Or maybe your partner discovers that they're really into bratting, in which case then don't brat with them. I'm actually at a nightclub of full latex kinky right now. Oh my gosh, that's so funny. I thank you for checking in from the club, from the club. I wish I could do that, but I don't have time. <laughs> There's not really anywhere here I think that does like latex events, but it would be fun to see if that happened. Uh, what suggestions would you give to a friend that's interested about BDSM? Oh, that's very general. Read books. Uh, I don't know, what would my number one piece of advice be? Just learn from as many sources as possible podcasts are great books are great youtube videos is great like just like i almost approach it like i would approach language immersion like you want to do everything in a lot of depth of research really get into it like don't do it so much you overwhelm yourself when you burn out but 
do it enough to where you really understand what it is you're getting into. Like, again, listen to podcasts, read books, watch YouTube videos. Uh, you know, I wouldn't recommend, I don't know, getting into BDSM via, like, making a FetLife account right away. But, I don't know. I just, I don't know. <laughs> this isn't very helpful. I just feel like the answer is, like, uh, read about it. See what you like. If you have access to a dungeon, maybe go to a dungeon and watch people do scenes. I don't, I don't know. Uh, in regards to the asexuality question, I linked several movie, several videos. Awesome, thank you, Justine. Get it covered. Uh, mm. Have a question about cigar service. Don't find too much about that, usually from a male perspective. Uh, I have, and I think this is still available. I don't think this is one of the ones I lost when I lost my laptop. But I have an older Patreon video that is a cigar service video. That's like a whole tutorial on cigar service and like a whole, like it's a mini scene, I think, too. It's a couple years old, so I don't remember everything I did in it. But I have a video on my Patreon, $10 plus tier, that is about cigar, cigar service from like a female bottom male dominant partner perspective. If you want to know more about like smoking fetishes or like femdom smoking or like cigar service for, for femdoms, it's a thing that I see that I know exists, but like online, you wouldn't know it. Like there's definitely lots of women that, that do cigar service, that receive it, that do it for other people. Lots of lesbians in like the lesbian leather community that do it. But yeah, you're not really going to find as much about it online, but it definitely is out there. Um, but if you have a specific question about cigar service, I might be able to answer it here. But if you just want to like see representations of it, I do have a video about it on my Patreon. Marriage is honestly just a financial contract, legally speaking. I mean, yeah. Like I told a very close friend who is sometimes online play partner, I'd be happy to marry her just to get her on my work insurance. Said she at the time didn't have anything. I mean, yeah. Is that insurance fraud? I don't know. Uh, but, you know, America, right? Have you ever had a DS relationship 24-7, not just during playtime? Yes. Um, most of my DS relationships have been 24-7. Like the whole relationship is DS has been the majority of my experience, but certainly not all of it. Your channel has helped. Okay, wait. Let me read that. This is a big one. I want to make sure I'm getting this right. Uh, your channel has helped me so much. Do you happen to have any advice for 24-7 DS relationships who have children living at home to keep things strong but safe for everyone? A couple of things. One, if you are free the 20th, 24th, check out the thing I linked earlier with the... Power Exchange Summit, because there's going to be a ton of classes all about DS relationships, and I know for sure that people that are teaching are going to be able to answer questions about children and living scenarios with 24-7 DS. If you haven't seen it yet, go watch my interview that I did with Loving BDSM. Uh, they, and also maybe Dan Don Williams, but I know for sure the one did with Loving BDSM, we talk about being parents, because they had like a, they have a blended family. They had kids from other marriages before getting married to each other. And so they have experience with navigating kids and DS relationships. We talk about that in the interview that I did with them. It's a lot of really good advice, like from actual lived experience. And I don't have that because I am not a parent. So I'm not sure what else to say besides watch that. Uh, you know, it would, I guess the general thing is like, you know, keep things out of your kid's eyesight, keep things in lock boxes. You know, if you have time or money for a babysitter to go to a BDSM event at a club or to even just go to a hotel room, that's really awesome. And I know that something that they talked about in the interview that I did with them is as their kids got older and they were all in school, like things got a lot easier because they worked from home or at least they transitioned at one point to working at home. And so they were able to occasionally, you know, do stuff either during the daytime or go to a hotel room during the day and do stuff there and have a way to find that connection when their kids run around. If you have kids that are like doing homeschooling or you, you all homeschool all your kids or they come back in the middle of the day, they do school part-time or something, I don't know, or you have like college age kids living with you at home that are kind of there part-time and you kind of come home randomly, that can be more difficult to navigate. But again, that's like, you should go watch the interview. And then generally I always recommend the Loving BDSM podcast. They have episodes on YouTube, they have you know, all the usual podcasting apps have their episodes on them and they talk about you navigating kids and, and life and DS a lot. So check that out. Besides uh, Gorian, not Gorian, Gorian. Let me say that wrong. Uh, are you aware of any 
Arabian Nights. Oh, that's an interesting way of, of, of framing that, I guess. Uh, type kink, for want of a better term. Uh, yeah, definitely for want of a better term. You know, I don't really see a lot of regular, what would you call it, harem fantasies? Like, that's not... I would say the other place I've seen that... What is it? What is it? It's the Anne Rice books. I think it's the the later, not the first Sleeping Beauty trilogy book, but the last two. There's some things in there that involve um, people of a swarthy persuasion doing things on boats and being kind of like the villainous captors. It gets kind of into racial stereotyping in a way that I'm not super comfortable with, but it is out there. So that would be the only other example of it I can think of. But in terms of like a kink that people do in real life as like a as a thing well okay wait there's one thing and it's not even i think it's kind of incidental more so than it is like on purpose um there is um um Bastinando, which I think has an Arabic version of it as well. There's Bastinando, which is like feet whipping and feet caning. Um, but I can't remember what the word for it is. In one case, it's called Falaka, but I don't remember if that's the actual word. I'm trying to Google it. Okay, yeah, yeah, yeah. It's a foot whipping, uh, which is also called uh, Falaka or uh, Falanga. I don't no if i feel like that word is arabic in origin i don't remember where i heard that i'm trying to find i'm looking at google okay yeah, yeah, okay okay yeah yeah okay so this is there's middle eastern falaka in iran so like it's at least a persian thing that would be the other closest thing you could think of anyways learning with evie now you know it's uh you know but that's like a very that's not the closest that's like the closest thing to think of. Like it's not, I, I'm sure if like you were in Europe or like Turkey or somewhere, you'd probably see more BDSM based on like that kind of a thing. In the same way that like a kink in India or Japan has things that are more like traditionally associated with that region. But I don't know of other things off the top of my head besides that. And that's probably for the best because it can kind of get into uncomfortable territories with racial stereotyping pretty quickly, and I prefer to leave that at the door, you know. All right, let's get to some more questions. Where are we at? Okay, it's only 6.30. We've got time. Okay. Okay, explain why I'm on the cell phone. Uh, what about discrimination disabled people face? I mean, that's definitely a thing. I don't, I don't know what that's in reference to. The, the disabled people face discrimination. Like, yeah, that's the, absolutely. And that's a thing that I think we should address more in the kink community. And it's something that is a constant upward battle, is what I would say. It's an up, uphill struggle. I want to do educational videos from my experiences, but I'm scared that I'm going to get judged on things. Okay, my advice is if you want to ever do videos on the internet, is you have to let go of the expectation you're going to please everyone and i have a perfect example of this that i just put on my twitter the other day i don't with my moving my lighting closer because one of my eyes oh there okay there we go um you have to let go of the assumption or the wish or the hope that you are going to make everyone happy because i had a recent experience, it's like a really great way to highlight this, of I did a video that came out, I think it was yesterday, right? And back to back, I kid you not, the two most recent comments I saw when I went to my, my studio to look at comments, the, the first one was, what was the first one? It was like, I love, I, I love these long in-depth videos. These are so awesome, thank you so much. And then the one immediately before that one said, you need to make your video shorter. They're way too long. Get to the point. And it's like, you know, you're never going to make everyone happy. And so I think you have to sort of initially like 
take criticism on board, right? But like, it has to be legitimate criticism. Like I've had people tell me I need to download an, like an Audacity plugin to make my voice sound less nasally to be less annoying. And I'm like, this is my voice. Like I can't, this is just how I speak. I can't help it. I'm not, I can't physically change my vocal cords. I don't want to lie about how my voice sounds to please someone. So sorry, this is the voice you're going to get. If it's nasally, I apologize, but that's all I can do about it. So you know, take on board the legitimate criticism of people that are trying to give you advice for like better production or how to whatever. But like, you know, if people are just saying things to be mean or tell you you're wrong, like that's always going to happen. That's every YouTuber, every genre. It doesn't matter if you're doing makeup, politics, current events, drama, you know, game reviews. Doesn't matter. People are always going to critique what you say, how you say, how long the videos are, how short they are, what you choose to cover, what you don't. Like, you want to make stuff that makes you happy to make. And yes, like make stuff the audience wants to see too, but ultimately it should be fulfilling for you to do and for you to talk about. And if it's not, then don't do it. But honestly, like in my experience from making videos, like I'll occasionally get like pushback on a subject, but either it tends to be people that are like, they just hate all of BDSM or they hate like one, like they think that DDLG is gross or they think that brats are not real submissives and they'll comment on every single one of my videos, brats aren't real subs, brats aren't real subs. And I'll just rinse and repeat that for 30 videos. And then, you know, they kind of, you know, just pissing in the wind. And, uh, but besides that, like, and you can tell those people right away that they're just saying stuff because they want their opinion out there. And they think that by saying it enough, they'll convince me that like, I'm wrong. And that's not how it works, obviously. Like, I have reasons for my beliefs that are based on personal experience, not random internet people pressuring me into believing a certain thing or not. But, you know, with more legitimate criticism, like, I think actually somebody in this chat um, left me, I think, a really good comment about my Andrew Tate video about how like it was disappointing it came across as like I was being really judgmental or like jealous of Pearl I think that's totally legit right now that wasn't in my heart when I made that video like I feel bad for Pearl like if you guys haven't seen that video Pearl is like a a femme cell basically she's like a female incel that like is desperate for male attention and pals around with the likes of Andrew Tate and other you know sort of male supremacist people which is what I'm just going to call them they're male supremacists uh, and I feel bad for her. I feel bad that she feels stuck in having to make that kind of content that she has to behave a certain way and kind of degrade herself and her own gender in order to get male attention. And I feel bad for her, but I also am like, you're just, I've seen what you do when you respond to people who respond to you and the way that you clip them, you're very uncharitable. You, you, you're not interested in having a conversation any kind of pushback you get gets titled with like angry SJW loses it in debate and like clearly not somebody who was interested in any kind of meaningful exchange of ideas therefore the way that I disempower them is to like blur their face not mention them have the important conversation that I want to have with that dialogue but not perpetuate her own fame and her own self-aggrandizement more than I can but I understand how that might come across as like oh, the jealous, insecure, you know, whatever. And I don't want that to interfere with the point I'm trying to make. So like now I'm thinking if I cover Pearl again, like I might change how I approach things. I might not blur her face. I might say things differently because while I dislike Pearl personally, I feel bad for her and I don't want to like come across as more angry about her than I really am, if that makes sense, which I feel like I have a problem with. Like, and this is always an inner problem, right? Like people are always going to assume your emotions are bigger than they really are because the limitations of technology, uh, you know, kind of create a layer of like, you have to make your own assumptions and interpretations of what people say and do. And that's not always going to be perfect. Anyways, content creation is, is fun, but also difficult. And I think that if you ever decide that you want to make content, you should go out there and do it. You should make a video. I would say for the most part, 99% of comments are helpful, nice, understanding, good productive comments and then the rest of them are just people that mostly aren't worth paying attention to and once in a while you know you're going to get something that's legitimate criticism and be like oh i didn't know about that i should do it differently and then you listen to that and have it have your ego not get in the way which i definitely struggle with but i think in the last like year or so i've been better about like being able to take criticism on board because i've tried to do that and tried to separate it out what's like legitimate criticism from people that just want to say mean shit all right, I've definitely missed some some comments, but it could be at the bottom of the thing, so uh, we'll, we'll have to go from there.
I love John and Kayla as well as the submission guy, uh, submissive guy. Both of them discuss the subjects, uh, always playing around. Uh, there's always a playing around kid through text messages. Yeah, like text messages, emails are great. You know, just make sure you don't have like a family computer that kids have access to. That would be my advice. All right, I can see we got some super chats. So I'm going to pop over to that real quick. Hopefully YouTube will let me do that. Oh, thank you, Jay. Thank you again. Um, I don't see if there's a question attached to that, but I will try to find them. So, munches are meetings with those in the community like this, but are at a bar, restaurant, etc. Yes, that's that's exactly what a munch is. I don't know if there's a question related to a munch, but it seems like people answered it. So, thank you. My boyfriend has always been vanilla, but he's interested in BDSM. He is very nervous. He will hurt me during impact play. Classic. Very common. Uh, how can I help him get past that? He knew before we started the relationship. Okay, so, so it's great that you both knew before the relationship. It's great that you've been open. Really good place to start. I feel like oftentimes this kind of assumption about impact play is because people think of like, I don't know, kink.com pornography or like... I don't know, like the red room scene from Fifty Shades where she has to say red after like 10 hits. But I think it's like always this like super wild out there, super painful experience. And I think it's important to remind him that, and anyone really, that impact play can be a huge diverse range of experiences from very, very light and sensual and, and like arousing and erotic over to like really intense bloody torture scenes, you know, everywhere between those two places. So I think, I don't, like, again, and I've had people ask me for recommendations, but and I legitimately don't know where to send people. So if you guys have an idea, like, please let me know. But I get people who want to see, like, real scenes, like, example of real scenes. And the reason why I can't send you a real scene is because it's difficult in the same way, and YouTube, please do not demonetize me for saying this, but it's the truth. Uh, you can't really find that online recorded in the same way that you like it's very difficult to find porn that is just real sex because the instant you're being recorded cameras on the 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 logistics of that in terms of batteries being charged lighting camera setup you know microphones maybe even like that changes the dynamic of how you're doing the scene it always adds a level of artifice to that that means it's different from what you would see in a dungeon and because you know dungeons are typically private places where you may have a bunch of members of the public you know 20 people all playing at once that don't consent to being recorded like you can't go into a dungeon and record live play happening at a dungeon the closest you're going to see is like femdoms that record their sessions but those are always very dramatized because dramatized because they are done for an audience in order to incentivize them to purchase a video, to purchase a full recording, to reserve a time slot for a session with them. So it's very difficult to actually show anyone online like what a real scene looks like. And even places like FetLife where people are just random folks posting their bruises and impact play scenes, uh, you have to pay, I think, a certain amount of money per month to FetLife to get access to video recordings. And again, they are mostly dramatic, uh, dramatized, you know, fantasy scenarios that don't look like how most people actually really play. So if you can find something in the needle in a haystack of, of options, like you might be able to find something that will be helpful, but most things are not going to be good examples. Um, oh my God, I knew that so badly. I forgot I had water up here. Um, the, the other thing is that like you can... Like, would they be comfortable, like, having you demonstrate on them? Like, would, could you do a scene where you're like, this is what impact play is like, and then you can demo on them and just go, like, really, really light? Like, is that possible? Or even you, honestly, like, you could do it on yourself where you're like, it doesn't have to be, you don't have to go, like, full hob, right? You can just go, like, you know, impact play, done, succeed, you've done it. Like, you know, it can be very light. You can show them, like, Impact play doesn't have to be whoosh, whoosh, whoosh. Like it can be nice taps, with like squeezing and some massage. Like I think the best, I think I have a video either about this, either I've made it recently, it's coming up soon. But uh, I do have a video for like new doms and tops, with advice for them that hasn't come out yet. That'll probably be next week or the week after. And 
in that or in another video. I know I have this written somewhere. I don't remember what it was for, but I had to talk about this. Is I think a really good like beginner impact placing for people that are nervous about like, I don't want to hurt you, is to do an erotic massage or just a regular, it doesn't have to be erotic. I don't know if you're BDSM sexual or not. So erotic or not erotic, depending upon your preference. Doing like a full body massage, like massaging on the back, on the legs, and then like going onto the butt muscle and doing a massage there. And then like slowly changing that from like a massage into more like pressure, into like tapping, into light spanking, and then back into a massage. And then just like alternating back and forth with that. So it's, it feels like it's as a bottom, my experience with this is very relaxing. It's very enjoyable. It's a really good mix of like sensual and romantic, but also it's not too complicated. It's like a beginner can easily do it. And if like, they don't know how to massage, like you, there's a bajillion free YouTube videos on like basic massage techniques. You go to the library, get a book, like there's options on how to do massage. But really, you don't have to overthink it. Just incorporate it into stuff that you probably already do. And again, I do think that doing something like a light massage is a really good way to do this because it's a very natural way to go from like a soft, gentle touch to a firmer touch to like a harsh touch in terms of impact play and then back down again and then back up again and then back down again and back up again. And hopefully that'll help them see that like when you're reacting to the impact place, it's also very important. Like, are you relaxed? Do you enjoy it? Do you, and I'm not saying you don't do this. I'm just kind of giving a general example of like, how can you make sure you at the bottom are giving the appropriate feedback to make sure they know that you're enjoying it. That would be stuff like, you know, saying, oh my gosh, it feels so good. Like, you know, like, mm, it's like nice, good verbal confirmation that you're enjoying what's happening, staying in a relaxed body language, you know, wiggling around, encouraging them, you know, just generally taking a positive mindset towards it. I think that, that really helps. All right, next question. Uh, I haven't seen them posting for a while. Oh, uh, they did a YouTube video recently. I don't know about like their podcast recordings, like how up to date they, they do this. Um, somebody said something about a hot mommy, what? I gotta figure out how to make this YouTube live chat stay up because it's not working with me. Is it because I'm tapping on the thing? I'm sure y'all have amazing questions, but I can't see them. Okay, what's happening? Live chat. There we go. Uh, somebody's mad at Fat Life for something. I saw that real quick. Mm. So something about liquid lipstick. I don't know what the question was. I wear liquid lipstick currently. It does come off a little bit, but not nearly as much as like regular lipstick. Uh, any tips for seeing a pro dom? I have an appointment in April, but I still live with my mom. I'm 30 years old and disabled, by the way. Uh, that's another part two. Uh, she has access to my bank account. I'm scared if she finds me taking out 300 euro from the ATM. So remind me. No worries. Um, if you have, you have, you have until April to get the money. So I feel like if I'm saving up for a pro dom appointment, what I would do is I would take out like, if you're if you get if you have something else you regularly get money out for like groceries or something like just take out a little bit extra every single time you do that like take out 75 instead of 50 you know and then put that 25 bucks aside and then after you know how many weeks is that it'd be yeah like eight eight weeks maybe of doing that like you're gonna have enough money no it'd be, it wouldn't be eight weeks it would be eight it would be 12 weeks of like taking out extra 25 bucks every week like that hopefully wouldn't be enough for there to be any suspicion towards your mom of like, why does I'm taking out the rigid euros from your bank account? Like it would just be like, oh, groceries are more expensive or I got coffee or whatever. Uh, and hopefully that shouldn't be too strange, but that would be what I would do. I don't know if that's really helpful. If the concern is like mostly seeing, you know, how to get the money part of it sorted. And I'm assuming that cash is like the way to go. Uh, gonna have to spend money to get my question answered too long and expensive i mean you could literally if you want to do a super chat you could do it with two dollars uh, i i can but um 
the technology I'm working with today is a little limited in that regard. So I'm trying my best. You can always come back next week. So don't worry. I love my Brad. She's 100% a submissive. I just have to earn her submission. I love that, Greg. I think it's good to point out that like there are people who enjoy and even love brats because people act like no one really likes brats. They just tolerate them. And it's like, I don't know what part of the BDSM community you've been a part of. And maybe you haven't actually done real life BDSM at all. And so you don't actually know what other people think about BDSM besides yourself and your own personal experience. But lots of people fucking love brats. Like just they live for brats. Like it's they think it's fun, like the feedback, like the taunting, like the teasing, like they're all about it. So, you know, it is what it is. Uh, have, have any good alternatives for ball gags for someone who has a sensitive, who has sensitive T slash jaw? Um, any other type of gag? Uh, I, I think part of it is, and I wish I can't go, I'm fine, I can't get an example. But um, different sizes of ball gag can make a difference. There is a German company that I get gags from, though they're very expensive. So I ha like I have a couple, and like they're if you're in Europe, they're great. But if you have to get them in America, the shipping is like the, more expensive than the gag itself. Um, if you're in the U.S., Paradox, I think it's Paradox Pleasure or Pleasure Paradox, some combination of that. They make really good gags as well, in like a bajillion different sizes. So it could just be that you need a, a smaller size. I think that most standard ball gags you get like off the rack are either 45 millimeters or 52 millimeters and i find is it millimeters okay wait i want to make sure i'm giving you the right me measurement here because if i'm not this isn't going to help at all um but there's a german company called self delve that's on etsy um that makes really good stuff that i, I get things from and they have a bunch of different sizes of ball gags like just any size of ball gag you can want, they pretty much make it, not for all of their designs, but they have a, two different firmnesses. They have a squishy and a hard, and I like the squishy ones, I think feel better. And then, okay, so this, it is, this, it's centimeters, not millimeters, my bad. I don't know what, if that's a diameter. Okay, it's a, it, it, 40, 45, or 4.5, okay, 4.5 centimeters is 45 millimeters, isn't it? I've just messed myself up for no reason here. Oh, it's been a while since I've had to do conversions like this. Um, so the, uh, the diameter is 4.5 centimeters to 5.2 centimeters for like the average gag size. And for me, 4.5 centimeters is kind of like the edge of what's comfortable. 3.8 centimeters or like the smaller gags might be better for you if you have jaw pain, but you also don't have to use a ball gag, right? Like, uh, you can get like a gag, get a bar gag. You can get like a Jennings gag or like a dental gag where it holds your mouth open. You get a ring gag. I recommend for people that have jaw issues um, using like a bandana and like tying the bandana back around your neck or so, or like a dish towel or something because that is just like that's going to be the least amount of material trying to keep your jaw open but it has a very like BDSM feel to it at the same time or again you can get like they make like leather gags or like little leather pillows basically that are instead of being like circular and big like a ball gag they're more flat and so that kind of fits in your mouth a little bit easier or again like bar gags or big gags too. That can be good. But if you really struggle keeping your mouth open at all and any kind of mouth openness causes you soreness, then I would go for like a tea towel or a bandana or something tied around uh, behind your behind your head. But that's usually the best. Or just no gag at all, right? You could do you could do like bondage tape over the mouth and, and have that be your way of like restraining speech. You know, if that's the reason for your wearing a gag. But you know, sometimes having this in your mouth is fun, you know. Um My phone's hot. I don't know why. That's probably not good. I don't know. It's fine. Um, oh, stay away from like wiffle ball gags. Anything that's like a hard plastic, don't. It's not good for your teeth. Mmm. How can you tell a dom that he's going too easy in impact play without breaking a seam? 
good question. Um, God, it depends so much on the role play that you're doing. Like, there's lots of ways you can do this, but it depends on, like, are you doing, like, a daddy boy scene? Are you doing a submissive you know, dom scene? Are you doing a master slave scene? Are you doing a pet play scene? Uh, so it depends on, like, kind of what role play flavor you're going with, if you have one at all. Um, I feel like this is where, like, negotiation comes in really handy because you can, like, pre-negotiate for... I'm doing this kind of scene and I, you know, when we're doing this, I want to communicate with you and let's do like the traffic light system. And let's say that like red means hard stop, yellow means check in, and then green means like keep going or more. And so you can have a really key way of just being able to say green, you know, and then you can indicate without breaking the whole scene space that like you're ready for more. Um, Nonverbal communication can work, but it's nonverbal communication. So it's always going to be imperfect. That would be things like, and depending on where you're doing the impact play, right, that could be like wiggling your butt, that could be like doing a little dance, that could be, um, you know, it could be even like tapping yourself maybe. Uh, if you are a brat, this is where teasing comes in, right? This is where you go, is that all you got? Or uh, I thought you could hit harder than that. Or like you hit like a girl or, you know, if that's like your role play flavor, right? It totally depends on like role, role, role play flavor you're going with. But those are just some examples that you can do to kind of egg someone on and and make them hit you harder but i would recommend either talking about it ahead of time to make sure you have a way to communicate that you want more or indicating to your partner like nonverbal signals ahead of time like if i wiggle my butt that usually means i want more or if i do this with my hand it means i want more like come up with a way to communicate that either verbally or non-verbally that won't break the scene space but if you were in the moment and you didn't negotiate for that then you have to kind of just like hope that they check in with you and then when they check in with you you could say oh my gosh it's so amazing i want more like you can like say it in a way that's complimentary that's like that is my biggest piece of advice because i think there's a way to do it where it comes across like that's all you've got like this is so boring and there's a way to do it that's like wow this is so amazing i i need more like you know there's a difference between being like that wasn't very good and i'm not satisfied and like this is so amazing i can't get enough so make sure you're going more towards that side of like, this is so amazing, I want more, and not like, this is dumb. This is not even impressing me at all. Unless you're bratting and you're doing that to like egg the other person on and it's not negotiated. But yeah, okay. Um, next questions. Is it weird to enter the BDSM community a little later in life? I'm almost 40 years old and just starting to explore my BDSM desires that I've had for years. I don't want to be the creepy old guy. Uh, great question. Uh, uh, great, uh, great question, Noah. Um, I, hmm. It is not weird or even unusual to start later on in life. Like I would say if you go to a BDSM party, it's like a general BDSM party, the average age you're probably going to see people is like 35 to 55, not 18 to 35. Most people that are in the BDSM scene that can participate in it are older, more established people, uh, couples, single folk, like you kind of get everything. But it does tend to be mostly older people. And so it's not unusual for people to, especially because of how like suppressive our society is towards any sort of non-normative or even normative like sexual interest like it's it takes people oftentimes a really long time to know that their desires are bdsm or know that liking bdsm is okay or that people actually do it and so there are lots of people that don't get into the scene until they're you know they're on their second marriage or after a divorce or after they've had kids or they're empty nesters like you get a lot of people that come in at older life stages because you know they had to go through a midlife crisis or a divorce or until their kids were raised before they really realized, oh, this is what I want from a relationship. This is what I want to try. And so certainly 40 is not unusual. Like I have a partner that I've, I've known for years that like they're pretty close to 40 at this point. And, you know, they didn't really get into doing proper BDSM until like a couple of years ago, until they were in their kind of mid late thirties, because well, what they, they thought they were doing BDSM before, but what they were doing was like spanking girl in the bedroom sometimes. That was kind of the extent of it. But as they got older, they realized that they wanted more than just that. And they wanted to do like actual BDSM, not just like, and not to minimize it, but like, I think we can agree there's a difference between like occasional spankings post-coitally and full-on BDSM scenes, you know? And like, because the context of it is different, you know? But yeah. 
I don't know what I'm doing with my hair. I'm just living with it. I'm just doing it. Um, ba -da -ba -ba -da, ba -ba -da -da. Okay. The dogs outside are barking. FYI. If you can hear that. Uh, I want to make an OnlyFans with a femdom, but I don't know any femdoms to do it with. I don't know any femdoms that are on OnlyFans, and it's because OnlyFans is very restrictive of BDSM content. So that may unfortunately be a dream you can't realize, depending on what kind of content you want to do on OnlyFans. Oh, this is the, okay. I'm mad at Fat Life when I found out last week that they had a thousand kink limit. Oh, do they? That's funny. Because, like, isn't Twitter currently having problems with, like, tweet limits? It feels connected somehow. The universe is connected. Mm. Also, hand slip, bottoms move around, it's not necessarily knowledge. Yeah, mm -hmm. exactly. Um, it would be really nice to learn from genuine scenes, but then again, scenes can vary depending on what's negotiated. And that's it, right? Like, even like, it's kind of just like the farther back you get from it being a real scene the more removed from it you are, the harder it is to actually, I think, take away proper lessons from it because you never know what's negotiated. You don't know how long they've been playing together. You don't know what their limits are. And you can watch a real scene, but not have the full context necessary to really process it appropriately, if that makes sense. What are your thoughts on makeup being bad? What about makeup is bad? Like animal cruelty, like animal testing on makeup? Uh, is there any kind of sealer for lipstick actually? Not really. Um, Maybelline has like a liquid lipstick that has like a sealer thing on it, but liquid lipsticks is the closest thing. Trust me, I've looked. There's not really any good products for lipstick that make it super sealable. Because for the most part, like, if it's a lipid at all, it doesn't matter if it's, like, monopolar or, or, or whatever, or, or dipolar, um, it, oily stuff will generally remove a lipstick. And then water-based stuff generally doesn't really work that well as a sealant either. So, like, liquid lipstick, which is what I'm currently wearing, you know, you get, I get a little bit off on my hand because it's red, and I've also been wearing it for five and a half hours at this point. Um, you know, liquid lipstick will come off as much but there's not really a way to make it like all 100% waterproof I know that there's probably youtubers you can watch where they've done like makeup reviews of like waterproof makeup setting sprays I don't know how well that works on the lips though um I know for the rest of the face it probably works a lot better Feels like my flogger handles might have more lipstick on them than anything else. That's funny. Um, what is a question or concern you wish more people would bring up when negotiating a scene? I think the number one thing that I wish people would bring up more is I wish they would talk about the feelings they want to have during a scene. And I've talked about this in kind of some recent videos and I'm sure I've mentioned it in other places. But I feel like a lot of people talk a lot about what they want to do in a scene. They don't talk about how they want to feel. Like they'll talk about like, I want to do a DDLG scene with an over the knee spanking and you paddle me and I want you to dress up in like a 1950s dress and I'm going to wear this tutu and I'm going to do this that and the other. Like it's all about the action. It's all about what's going to happen, where it's going to happen, the furniture, the costuming, the setting, the everything else, right? All of those details get worked out. People don't talk about how they want to feel during the scene. What is the intention of the scene? What is it trying to accomplish? Because it is very possible you can negotiate for a scene where both of you are in sync on the actions of the scene. Like, oh yeah, I love spanking. I love 1950s roleplay. I love this and the other. Like you agree on all the perfunctory actions of it, 
but you don't agree on how to actually make each other feel in the scene. Like for one of you, it might be very like, I don't know, let's get to like the economy example. So let's do one person wants to do it because they want to feel really humiliated and it's like a it's like a humiliation embarrassment oh my god like my bare bottom's exposed i'm getting spanked i've been so naughty all oh, the embarrassment the injustice of it all like they want to revel in that like that humiliation that feeling exposed and embarrassed side of it and then for the other person they might be into it because you know they like the caretaking and and the affection in it right that they like the emotional connection and feeling like I, I discipline you because I care about you and I'm disciplining you because I want you to be better. And like, it's like the opposite of feeling humiliated. And so like, if you don't talk about feelings you both want, you can really have a lot of crosstalk around how the actual scene will go that can lead to you doing the scene as planned, but still not being satisfied because your emotional needs weren't considered fully by the other party. You know, that's, that's basically what it is. My question got skipped or was or was just the second I was giving food to my cats. Oh, well, um, I am on my phone right now, Vera, so I am much more limited in being able to see messages. I don't think I remember seeing a question from you. I'll just scroll up real quickly. But I don't think I saw a question because usually I recognize. Oh, but Evie Brett's aren't real subs. Yeah, I saw that comment. Was that a question? Your voice sounds perfectly all right. Thank you. Yeah, I don't think I see any other questions from you. But let me know if I missed something. I'll try to get to it. I scrolled up as far as I can scroll up. Um, Brats are like a love or hate, right? Um, yeah, I think they, they people definitely have strong opinions about brats. I think that's fair to say. Um, you know, I'm okay. Like, hey, don't, don't, don't get too aggressive on my behalf. It's all right. Um, trying to see here. I'm just gonna, I'm tired of, I'm gonna see if I can, if this is like better. I'm like holding my phone directly now. I think if I keep scrolling, we can get this stuff better. I think if your question was about if brats are a love or hate thing, I think I did answer that. The answer is yes. <laughs> it is. People have strong opinions about brats. Um... 40 years isn't old, life begins at 40. Yeah, fair enough. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I don't want to say that 40 is old either because I think, honestly, like, like you're maybe halfway through life at 40. Like, you're just getting started. I was 48 when I got started. I got started in BDSM when I was 31. 40 is not weird to me. Yeah, yeah, yeah. A lot of people started in their 30s and 40s. Absolutely. Even their 50s, 60s even. I, I know people. I know people that get started in the BDSM community when they're in their 70s, okay? So, like, you're not too old at 40 by any means. I didn't get into the community until 30. Before that, Toxic Dom kept me from exploring that. Mm -hmm. That's, I'm sorry to hear that. Likely to keep me from learning batteries, lol. Oh, well, I mean, the people have all kinds of reasons for not wanting other folks to join the community, and that is certainly one of them. My partner and I started at 32 and 40, or sorry, yeah, 32 and 34. I'm glad we started at that age. The more worldly wisdom and emotional maturity is different at my age than it would have been at age 22. Yeah, definitely. Like, I wouldn't think about it, like, in terms of, like, oh, my gosh, I'm losing so much because I started late. I think about it, like, I have all this life experience that I get to take into doing BDSM. It's going to mean the process of getting started with this is going to be so much easier, you know? Um, a graphic novel about the realities of BDSM says that BDSM practitioners are just sexual nerds. Such a good description. Oh, are you talking about, oh, what is it called? Sunstone? Is that what you're referring to? Is the, okay, can we not like 
spam people. I'm gonna try and look at my. I should be able to do that. It. It was a question about condom use. Okay, I totally didn't see that. There was a question about condom use. I did not see it. So, if we can repaste it in the chat, I will be happy to answer it. Have you heard about the bisexual heteroromantic discourse? Um. Is that the one where the lady's like, I like eating pussy, but I don't like, I don't want to cuddle with you? Is that the discourse? I almost commented about that because I do have some feelings about it. Because I think, um, yes, uh, the Sam model, the split attraction model, is not just for asexual or romantic people. Like, it's for anyone. Like, you can be bi romantic and like heterosexual. You can be hetero romantic and bisexual. Like, you, whatever combination, you know? Well, um, I do think there's a difference between that, though, and, like, internalized misogyny and compulsive heterosexuality that means that you can only see other women as sex objects and you are unable to imagine being romantic with them when you can be romantic with men. So, like, I think it's possible. Like, it depends. Oh, my eyebrow, like, makeup. Like, I have a, something wrong with my eyebrow. I'm just messing with it. And we'll stop talking to you. Um, I do think that there is a difference, and that's, like, it's worth evaluating um you know where your feelings about it are coming from like are you feeling this way because you evaluated it you thought about it and this is like a sincerely held belief of like i just am not attracted to women outside of this, this is the only way that i like them or is it like i have been so wrapped up in pursuing men as like the goal for a romantic relationship that I am unable to see women as like equally able to be romantic partners and I just want to have sex with them and treat them like because like this the setup for that if you guys don't know this is on Twitter and there was a a a bi person a bi woman that is with a man in a monogamous relationship with a man romantically that like to go out and pick up women for hookups and possibly threesomes I think occasionally but mostly just like one night stand hookups and that was it, right? Like, she didn't want to date. She didn't want to cuddle. And this is like, there's a difference between I'm not romantically attracted to people and I will use you for sex and abandon you as soon as the act is over. Like, there's a difference between, oh, I'm not really into you romantically and it's just sex, but, like, we can still be friends. But, and there's a difference between that and, like, not even having the friends part of, like, the friends with benefits, you know? Like, where it's like, you were just using somebody for sex and then you're not gonna cuddle them you're not gonna do aftercare you're not gonna do pillow talk you're not gonna sleep together you're not gonna do anything vaguely nice it's just come in come and get out you know um and I'm sure that works for some people but it's like when it comes from a place of like I can I'm only able to view women a certain way I don't know about that but I am somebody that is asexual and the romantic, I don't know what's going on there. I, who knows? My orientation outside of being asexual is a complete mystery to everyone, including myself. So I, um, I, you know, that's, that's my. This me. I almost think it's more common for women to treat other women like sex objects. Uh, if interested in women and there isn't much awareness of those attitudes and women via the men, yeah. Yeah. And so anyways, and people were like, oh my god, stop being biphobic. And it's like, it's, there's a difference between being biphobic and being like, hey, do you know what compulsive heterosexuality is? Have you heard of this one before? It's a real, it's a real, uh, real nugget of wisdom. It's, it's, a, it's an old chestnut. Though. <laughs> I love that one. Calling something an old chestnut is my favorite. All right. Um, oh, yes. Harmonica gag is a good one. It's a good DIY. Time we went. Oh, it's almost seven thirty. Okay. My phone's getting hot though. I'm kinda worried about it overheating. It is rapidly going through battery power. Um
Okay, give me give me a second. I'm gonna set my phone down again. Okay. We're gonna try some we're gonna try something new and different. Um I don't know why it's not working. Did they change something? Cause I can I can I can go after people. Give me a second here. We're gonna we're gonna catch up. Not to worry. Okay. Did I get the person you needed to get got? Let me know. <laughs> I think I got it. All right. Um, it is very complicated. I just want to say your videos have been helpful. Thank you, Chuck Duck. I'm glad that you enjoyed them. People believe it's okay, that's enough about that, but it's often used as a way of becoming more than the other partners. Oh, you mean like being fluid bonded? Like not using a condom with people? I mean, I get why people do that because like risking your bodily safety with people's fluids in you is like a higher level of risk, but like when you actually think about it practically, it's Um, I, I don't want to talk about what I started in school. I will be, I'll be very general because the de degree I got is very specific. I don't want people to find out where I went to university because I just, I try to leave as much stuff anonymous as I can. Um, but I double majored and I got a STEM degree. So there you go. That's, and now I make BDSM YouTube videos. So what was that about fucking getting it? Everyone's like, oh, it's so, it's so your degree is so important. It's so relevant. Like. You're gonna do important stuff, and then you're fucking, here I am, not working in the field. I got a degree in remotely at all, talking about BDSM on the internet for my job. Um, which don't get me wrong, I love that that is my job. It's great. I love this way more than working in like a lab or an office. But I, um, it's interesting. It's an interesting life choice that I made. But I did almost study history. You're right. I, I almost, I could have studied. I could have studied psychology. I could have studied um american sign language i could have studied history there were so many things that i would have been interested enough to get a degree in and it was just a matter of like practically what i thought was both the most interesting and what i could get a job with that i would enjoy without having to do higher education um because i originally was like oh what if i could i could do psychology and then i could get a master's degree and i could do research um but one that program is already very popular lots of people like undergrad psych degrees in my school were like really, really big. And I didn't want to immediately go from that and have a school debt from undergrad and then immediately go into grad school and get even more debt, even though I really like school. And honestly, at this point, I may end up going back to school at some point. I have kind of like two life plans, depending on how the economy slash my life goes. Because uh, academia is like a very soft market. Like it's not, there's not a lot of demand for like new academics at this point. So going into academia with the purpose of like doing research and studying things would be very difficult and a big life expense or uh, I will YouTube and the internet will end. I will no longer be legally able to discuss BDSM on the internet. I will go back and become a medical esthetician and I will live out the rest of my days owning a small business where I give people facials all day. <laughs> and and uh, you know, hopefully working with like, I like my, my idea in my head is like, okay, cause like YouTube, social media, with the way things are going, this is not likely to be my only job forever. That's just part of working online. Most people burn out, quit, they get banned from a platform, they get, I don't know, whatever, right? Like a million different things can happen. Like, you know, my, my uh, knock on wood, you know, like my, my account could get hacked and I could get my channel deleted tomorrow. Like I could have to start from square one. And if that happened, I would probably just like be hanging out on Patreon doing shit there. And then it would go back. I would become a medical esthetician and I would open a small business. And I would, I would do, I would have like a, like a queer LGBT friendly, like gender affirming, <laughs> like a, a, like skincare and like facial business. Like that, that, that's what I would do. 
I love like laser technology. I love all that stuff. I think it's really interesting. And I, I think that like doing things that make people's lives happier and better is what I enjoy doing. And like, I could go back to doing what I did before I did YouTube full time. Uh, but that work is soul draining. And I don't know if I'd want to do it again full time for the whole career of my life, you know, even if I would probably make better money than I would if I worked as an esthetician until I was like an advanced like medical esthetician. Um, but yeah, that's what I would do. Not that anyone asked that question. Why am I on my phone? Uh, because I don't currently have access to my full computer setup. So we're doing this instead. Temporary holdover. This is actually really convenient. It's actually really good if I have to travel again anytime soon. I really like knowing I can stream from my phone. Because I could do this in like a hotel. I could do this like kind of anywhere actually. It's not my favorite, you know, it's not like the quality is potato quality, but it is, it is a quality. So many things are so much easier when you're over the age of 25. I agree with that. I'm not going to lie. I learned new stuff. Chat ideas. Uh, Color-coded flogger with sub wearing harmonica gag while learning music and art for pain and flush. <laughs> yeah, like a xylophone. Like a kid's xylophone. Um, I have not read Sunset in a long time, so I don't know if there's any new stuff coming up. <laughs> One time a guy actually said I'm like a Snapple cat because of all the random facts I know. Oh, that's great. That's great. Uh, how do you explore BDSM as an asexual, not trying to be antagonistic, just generally interested? Yeah, totally. That's a completely fair question. Um, the same way that most people do. I mean, I don't know. I feel like I was really lucky because my introduction into BDSM was in a community space where like outright intercourse during BDSM play was not common. And even now in places I go to, it's not common. Um, in Portland, things are different because most of the BDSM venues are owned by swingers. And so the atmosphere and the play does tend to be much more sexual and it tends to attract people that are more interested in sex because it's not like a club where you have to have a membership to go orientation. Like you go and pay the cover to go into a club and you can go here, which is, you know, it's an easier entry point, but it's also the bar is lower for people that just want to like go look at the freak show, which is kind of a negative. But anyways, you know, where I, when I first started doing BD somewhere I lived there, and it's sadly no longer around, but there was a, a private club that was there that was in like an industrial part of town that was basically in like a big open warehouse loft sort of a space. And it was really nice, but it, it was definitely catered more towards like lifestyle, BDSM, people that weren't just doing it for sex. Like sex could be part of it, to be clear. But like people weren't out here doing like vaginal intercourse in the middle of the dungeon. Like you would sometimes like there'd be sex in like the aftercare area occasionally. There would be people doing like kinky blowjob stuff, but not really a lot of like outright direct sex is happening and so because of that i felt much more comfortable exploring and i honestly like for bdsm i've had some issues with partners that have been, oh yeah you know i don't play sexually and then they get into doing a scene and they have like a very sexual energy with the way that they actually end up doing their bdsm which i uh, i'm not looking for but for the most part i just say like hey the, i don't do this for sexy stuff i just i like the way that it feels i just you know all their emotion i get from it and that people are, are happy to work there on that and it hasn't been too difficult. I would say the biggest issue I've run into is with people that I'm partners with, where we start a BDSM relationship non-sexually. We start dating, we become romantic with each other, and then they expect sex. But it's not because of the BDSM, it's because of the romantic relationship. That's 
when things get mixed up. Oh, is that a band on my shirt? Yeah, it's an Evanescence t-shirt from the concert I went to last year. Yeah, I might need to end a little bit early because I'm kind of worried about my phone. <laughs> but I'll try to keep going. Um, I did not do one major and two minors. I double majored and then I almost got a minor in psychology. But I didn't get the sign off on the last class I was supposed to do, so I didn't technically graduate with a minor. Although I think I either am off by like a couple of credits or I had enough, I just didn't declare a minor. I think I messed something up there. I've had nightmares about this actually, about like not getting my degree because I didn't do something properly and having to go back to school. Um, but I think I either had enough for a minor technically or was off by like one class and I didn't get something signed off on. It was something like that. But I did a lot of psych classes just for like gen ed requirements, basically. You know, after getting started on my second degree, I honestly questioned the idea of making 18 year olds go to college. I was writing purely on social expectation and bad preconceptions first time. Yeah, I mean, I was really lucky in that I was as a kid, I was very academically focused. Like I like school, I like studying, I liked reading. I was interested in a lot of subjects. I could picture myself doing a lot of different things as a career. And so when it came time for school, I just had to pick the right school for me. And then like a degree that I liked and, and then something I liked. So I didn't even change majors when I was in school. I, I Before I declared a major, like when I was still in high school, but before I had, I think even finished applying anywhere, I had gone through options of like, I might want to do this, I might want to do that. But then when I got to school, I immediately declared what my majors were. And I just went on that path the whole three I technically didn't do four whole years I did like three and a quarter three and a half yeah it would have been three and a half because I, I graduated in the winter so I actually I graduated in like January or some shit uh, which is kind of random but I um I I had a very like straightforward pathway but most people I know were not like that most people I know transferred schools, changed majors, did five years instead of four years, which is like crazy because in the UK you have like a three year. Honestly, what's nuts to me is the school system in the UK because you have to basically pick what you want to do for your whole fucking life when you're the equivalent of a freshman in high school because you have to pick your GCSEs and then you have to pick your A-levels and then you have to, off, based off of your A-levels, you can apply for certain programs at schools and you have to declare your major when basically when you're going through the process of deciding which school you want to go to. So like, if you think you want to do physics in college, you have to be doing, you have to decide to do physics when you're like a 15 year old and you have to decide, okay, I'm going to do my A-levels. I'm going to do, I'm going to do like history stuff, right? I'm going to do European history, French language, uh, you know, British history, and then like comparative politics or whatever. I don't know what A-level choices are in the UK. And then you do that, and then you apply to school, and then you go on their history curriculum. And like, it's so difficult to change course because by the time you're 14, you have to have your whole plan laid out of like, these are my A-levels, these are my plans, this is what I'm gonna do, this is what I'm gonna apply to the school. And like, I, I, you know, as much as people complain in the US education system about like, I have to learn about stupid shit I don't care about, like, you, if you don't, you know, can you imagine for four years, like, of high school and college, never taking a single history class because you're a physics major, and then you have no basis in history at all. You don't know, you don't even know enough about it to know if you actually want to study it or not because you weren't fucking forced to learn it at any point. Like, I, um... I kind of give an example, like I didn't know if I would like geology or not, but I had to study geology to be able to find out if it was of interest to me. It sounded like it might be cool in the abstract or uh, cartography or planning or physics or uh, philosophy. Like, you know, what 14 year old knows whether or not they want to study philosophy in college and get a degree in philosophy? Probably not very many. So, I don't know, it just seems like kind of crazy that you have to even start even farther backwards in your life timeline to figure out what you want to do for your whole life. And, like, it dictates not only, like, what you major in, but, like, where you go to school. And that's, like, pretty nuts. 
Uh, they did have like some when I, I went to high school in Virginia. And I remember there were kids I went to school with that did know from the time they were 14, they wanted to be like architects or engineers. And so they did like pre-architectural and pre-engineering programs in my school. And then they would apply to like UVA and get into like the UVA or like the Virginia Tech architecture program or the engineering program, which are, from my understanding, like pretty prestigious, at least in that, you know, region of the country. And so that's what they would do. But like, that was not most people, which is not. UK school system is crazy. That's why I never went. I mean, yeah. To be fair, the UK school system is not like the US school system, and you take a lot more subjects before you even get to GCSEs. Well, like, then you're in, like, elementary school. You're, like, 10 years old. So it's, like, GCSEs are, like, middle school age, right? And then A-levels are, like, high school and, and, like, you know, early college age. So, like, I don't know. Like, yeah, I guess you take more subjects technically when you're, like, 10. But, like, the life science class I was in when I was 10 years old, like, what I was capable of comprehending at 10 years old is very different from what I'm capable of comprehending now at 28, you know? My first degree was a theology and ministry degree, long story. I left towards the end of a second year because the whole thing along through believe in God thing. Yeah, no, no, that'll do it. Suddenly, suddenly becoming an atheist will <laughs> put it down your college plan for sure. Um, I went to college from 2008 to 2011, dropped out, completed a two-year degree in 2014, and it's done a fat load of good, to be quite honest. I mean, that sounds sarcastic to me. I mean, I feel like everyone says you got to have the degree to be able to do anything with life, and I think that's kind of true in a lot of respects, but, um, like, I don't think it should be as valued as it is. Like, it does open doors, but should it? I don't know. I, I don't think so. <laughs> you should make a video and take it to the grocery store with you. That would be very boring. I don't, I don't even think, is there an interesting grocery store I can even go to? Maybe. Is, there a, oh, dude, is Whole Foods exciting? Have you ever seen candy or food gags being used? I guess it doesn't last long with brats. Um, there is a pretty popular, this might even be a gag gift. It might be like a vanilla thing <laughs> or like a bachelorette party thing. I'm sorry, like, my, my table I have this phone on is shaking a little bit because it's, like, old and crappy, so I apologize if, like, the motion sickness is setting in. But you can get, like, a jawbreaker ball gag. I, I know I had a friend who bought one to use in a scene. I can't remember if they ever ended up actually using it, but it was in their fridge for a long time. Yeah, but there are options. Like, you'll see apple gags for show, uh... But it's not really hard because anything that's like easily edible, like it has to be dissolvable. Not like if it breaks off into pieces easily, like that's a choking hazard. So like something like a hard candy, I think is usually what people gravitate towards. Oh, All right, my phone's starting to go into low pattern, low low battery saving. But okay, give me a second. I gotta. There's not really like a good outlet spot here, which is kind of the problem. Give me a minute. Entertain yourselves. Be polite. Oh, that's not going to work. It's a problem I ran into before. Okay. Okay, I think this will work. I don't know if this cord's long enough, but we'll figure it out. Oh, okay. Don't show us shit on my... Okay, I don't think I exposed anything um, incriminating. But, all right, we're back. Hi, everyone. We're hanging out here now. It's so different. Oh! <laughs> I did a filter! Oh, no! Okay, whoa, that was, that was nuts. What's this? What's Glamour? Look at this. Glamour. Okay, we'll just go back to normal. There we go. Um, okay, chat. <laughs> this video is brought to you by the like button. Yes, like the video. Oh, 
Okay, Vera, I swear, I am. I did not see your question. I looked for it. I saw part of a question about condoms. I was told, told it was a question about condoms. Um, but I did not see your full question about condoms and priorities. I looked for it, couldn't find it. So if you'd be kind enough to repeat it, I will try to get to it. But otherwise, I can't promise anything. Now, longtime fan of pegging and femdom, recently been into the sissy play, cross-dressing elements of those kinks. How can I communicate that interest with a partner who sees it as queer? Uh, if you didn't see my video I did with Carly DeVille, I'd recommend watching that one because we talk about navigating this with a partner. But I think, like, I don't know, some people just, like, have difficulty letting like, go of their prejudgments about things so that might be difficult to get your partner to see it differently than they already do. But... I think it's kind of just communicating that like I like this but I'm not gay like did you believe me or you don't like at some point they either believe you or not you know lagging yeah my over i'm gonna really quickly chance the question because vera's been very patient and then i think i'm gonna have to turn my phone off um uh condom uses as a way of becoming more than other partners i recently got together with an old friend and bdsm play partner um there's no question mark in that is that a question what's the question um I'm not sure what to say to that. I'm like, what is the question? It sounds like a statement. I'm maybe I'm missing something. I'm confused. Mm. Okay, is my stream even still going? What's happening here? Oh, dear. Okay, no, we're good. Oh, here we go. Okay. Um, sorry, my phone was like lagging for a second. I had to look at my computer. Um, what do you think about using the non-condom for making yourself the primary partner of someone without negotiating for that? People believe it's okay and it's enough about that, but it's often... Uses a way of becoming more than the other partners. I recently got together with an old friend and BDSM play partner. He was really wanting to do oral to me, but he expressed that he can't because of the negotiation with his other partner. That was after he ordered me to do oral on him. I mean, so you can give oral to him, but he can't do it. That seems fluid bonding is happening either way there. Um, I mean... I think people can use condoms as like a tool to preserve like specialness in a relationship for sure. That can definitely happen where people are like, well, it's special because I'm the only one that gets to do this without condoms. Now, I've never had a poly partner that has ever been okay having to use condoms with other people. They're always because I mostly date people that have penises. And so they're always like, condoms make you feel bad. And so they just rely on like testing. So I've never faced this where I've had a partner where they've used condoms with me but not with other people um and it's kind of shitty that you only learned about that boundary like during the act itself like that should be something you know beforehand like if there's going to be boundaries around what you can and can't do you should know that ahead of time you should go into it knowing that like we have to use barriers for this we can't do this at all um whatever like you should always be aware of that and like it can be a controlling thing on the part of the other partner but it could also like for some respects it is like an std risk mitigation factor like if you have a partner that has sex with lots of people have sex with lots of other people you are going to have a higher risk for sti transfer and it can go through very quickly and so it makes sense for especially like penetrative sex in terms of anal or vaginal sex to have condoms and to wear them and use them but for like if he can't come down on you, and I'm assuming you have a vagina, 
Um, most people don't use barriers for that anyways. Like, you, like they, they make oral dams. People don't usually use them. That seems kind of like um. That seems more of like a control boundary than like a legitimate STI transfer worry thing. If you got tested beforehand, like that should just be enough, you know. There are two other messages. Um, what? 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 Okay. It took me a minute to get to them. I'm sorry. My phone's fucking up here. Yeah, it doesn't make you more to use a con. I think that honestly, that sounds like a, something that your metamor, your partner's partner, has to work out in terms of like what is a rational, reasonable boundary and what is like just trying to control to feel special and feel different, which is like fine. Like, okay, you can want to feel special. Your partner has to be okay with that. And they can't be bad mouthing you to other partners being like, I wish I could do this, but my nag wife won't let me. Like, this is the problem I run into with Polly a lot that I've seen with people is like, like you're like the, the hinge partner usually do with a penis. Um, will, like, they will have a boundary with their primary partner that they've agreed to. They said they find, like, oh, yeah, baby, I always wear condoms, always do testing, like, no problem. I respect you. I love you. I totally get that. No worries. And then they go to par partner B, their side partner, and they're like, oh, my God, my fucking nag bitch wife makes me wear condoms and I hate it. And it's like, you agreed to that. You said it was fine to her face. But now you're saying behind, you know, you're bad, bad mouthing that decision behind your partner's back to this other random partner. Like, that does not make you look good. It doesn't make your partner look good either. Like, don't bad mouth people behind their back. Don't agree to boundaries if you don't actually want to have those boundaries, especially when you're just going to make fun of somebody for having them later. Like, if you agree to a boundary, you should be able to defend that to the people you have boundaries with. Like, hey, like, I'd love to do this. I, like, I love doing Earl, but we can only do this with a boundary, like, a, with, with a barrier, right? Or, like, you know. Or just be up front so that way you can know, as the other partner, what is actually on the table for an activity or not. Because um, then it's just unfair to everyone involved, right? Like, it's unfair to badmouth the other partner who has reasonable boundaries. It's unfair to not communicate those boundaries and say that they're there before getting into a situation. Like, it's just bad communication all the way around, honestly. Like, just don't make your other partner the bad guy for having boundaries, you know? Like, you agree to them. You get to, dis you get to say, sorry, no, like... I've had this fight with partners before where I prefer people wear condoms because I don't, like, I don't, if you are having sex on the first date, I don't trust the other partners that you are engaging with the, within six hours of knowing them. If you're having sex within six hours of knowing a human being and I've never met them, I don't trust them. Wear a condom with them, please, or I will wear a condom with you. Like, that's how this works for me. Like, I can't make other people have boundaries, but I can have boundaries for myself. And I can say, well, okay, that's great for you. But, you know, when I'm doing things with you, if you do this other thing, I'm going to do this instead to preserve my own safety level. And then people will try to fucking fight you on boundaries, and I hate this. You have to be a broken record with boundaries, okay? You have to be a broken record with boundaries where you have to say, this is my boundary. It is not moving. You are not going to talk me out of it. This is not a negotiation. This is There's a difference between negotiations and boundaries. Boundaries are like, this is preserving something for me, for my own health or safety, this is not a negotiation, you get to convince me to do something that I said I'm not doing. And you might have a boundary around having non-protected intercourse. And if your partner doesn't want to agree to that, okay, great. Like if they don't want to have condom sex with their people, okay, well, I'm going to have condom sex with you. We're not going to have sex at all. And take it or leave it. Like, and sometimes they hate condoms so much that they will leave it, but that's their problem, and that's going to be very difficult to navigate with Polly, honestly. To just only ever fucking be freeballing it? What? No. Uh, can we please not lump in everyone in this, uh, 
that was a penis in with what is really just men. Sorry. Oh, sorry. So I'm specifying men with penises. Not um. I should be clear about that. Sorry. Um, when I say when I say men with penises, I'm not saying that all men have penises or all people that have penises are men. I'm specific. I should just say cis men. Honestly, that'd just be the easier way of doing it. Because I don't know if these dynamics exist with trans men because I've never been in a polycule with trans men before, so I I I don't know. Um, but my experience with cis men that have penises is this. So. Oh, oh I lost the live stream for a minute. My bad. They wouldn't be able to do oral with you. Okay. Um, I am losing internet connection now on top of everything else. So um, I think, guys, this is difficult to, uh, apparently, I got to have a, I don't know, an ice bath ready for my phone while I stream. I've been in, a, in poly schemes for 18, or 19 years now. Never, this was a thing before. It was a new, new time for everything, I guess. Put thine foot down. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. If someone doesn't even want to kiss, I understand it. Mm -hmm. But someone putting power without even knowing her. Yeah. It's a non-binary person. Okay. Who's a non-binary person? The, the, the other, the metamor is? Or, okay, I'm just, <laughs> sorry. I don't, but I don't want to like misgender somebody I don't know from a story. But I'm, I'm trying to keep up. I need a float chart. <laughs> Ah, okay. You said a partner with a penis, which would include trans women. That's never been a thing for us. Okay, fair enough. I don't remember saying that, but I'll take your word for it. It's uh, What I had meant by, to clarify so that there's no future confusion, is I thought I had previously established that the person with the penis was male and a man, and this is man. I will try not to do that again in the future. Um, anyways, um, my phone is hot. It's burning my hand. It's not kind of the internet. It's... <laughs> Oh, this has been a hot mess, but thank you all for being here and enduring this crazy adventure with me of streaming from my phone for the first time. Um, this is good though. This is good for vacations and things if I'm out of town. I know it's going to be easy enough to stream from this, which is which is good. But yeah, um, I will see you guys around. Um, any announcements? Yeah, check out the summit. I am doing the DS summit. That's going to be the end of this month. And I'm editing it right now. I'm a, doing a deep throating video with a demonstration. Ooh, too definitely too spicy for YouTube. I'm doing a deep throating. I'm doing a redo of my deep throat training video for Patreon. I have it filmed. I'm editing it right now. That's going to be up before Valentine's Day. So if you want to surprise your sweetie with some deep throating action on Valentine's Day, as I know we all want to do. <laughs> Uh, that's gonna be a patreon uh, again. Thank you all so much for being here. Yes, non-con temperature play is happening on my phone Thank you all so much for being here. Have a good weekend uh, Ban is downstairs, so I can't give you all a preview of what she's looking like at the current minute But just picture her in perfect bandit bliss. And that's basically how she's gonna be and I will hopefully see you all again soon. Bye